Good evening. Um, uh, it's great to have you here, and, and uh, this is our new venue, uh, which is small, intimate, and we can sell it. Um, it's the criterion, and it, it, it has all the criterion, i.e. they said, yes, you can come here. Um, so this is our traditional Christmas show from the page to the stage. And as is traditional, I have my usual fantastic cast. So could you welcome on stage Mr. Harry Enfield, Miss Jan Ravens, and Mr. Lewis <laughs> McLeod. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> Okay, so we're in a proper theatre, and I realise nowadays that trigger warnings are important. Um, the Chichester Festival earlier this year for The Sound of Music actually did say, contains Nazis and the annexation of Austria. <laughs> <laughs> so, these are the trigger warnings. If you're going on somewhere later, you've booked another show. These are important. These are the trigger warnings for other shows and musicals that you might go to. West Side Story contains gang violence, racism and cultural appropriation. Guys and Dolls contains organised crime, gambling addiction and simplistic binary gender differentiation. <laughs> Mary Poppins contains harmful sugar, one spoonful, <laughs> to help the medicine go down. South Pacific contains claims that shampoo will wash that man right out of your hair, <laughs> which have not been upheld by the Advertising Standards Authority. We Will Rock You contains Ben Elton. <laughs> <laughs> the Full Monty contains nuts. Only Fools and Horses contains Trigger. Ah, <laughs> good, excellent, the first groan. It's very good of you to come out, um, particularly since I expect most of you are working from home. Um, we've done a number of surveys into working from home earlier this year, and we found that after a rigorous scientific study, these are the extraordinary results about whether people are happy with the three-day working week. 11% agreed that the three-day working week was a great innovation. 23% told us they would respond to the survey the next time they were in the office. 31% <laughs> said they were too busy doing the school run. 32% said they were unavailable as they had an Amazon package coming. 45% uh, were just making a quick snack but would get right back to us. 53% asked if they could possibly try a two-day week instead. Or maybe one day. 75% said they were too stressed to reply, as none of their colleagues were doing any work. And 100% said they'd like a new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. One of our great <coughs> surveys. <clears throat> it's now time for a quiz. Uh, this is Private Eyes feature Dumb Britain, uh, which is um, a compilation of real answers to real questions in quizzes on TV. This is compiled by Marcus Berkman. And remember, these are all real. They're from The Chase, Tipping Point, Master, Mastermind, The Weakest Link, The Wheel, and many others. And our presenter jointly for tonight is Bradley Walsh. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, audience. <laughs> Which 20th century Soviet leader is often referred to as Uncle Joe? Joe Pasquale. <laughs> Name something you have more than two of on your body. Arms. <laughs> In food and drink on spirits, beer and wine labels, the abbreviation ABV stands for alcohol by what? Voltage. <laughs> In cinema, the 2000-year Ang Lee film that was nominated for a Best Picture Oscar was called Crouching Tiger, Hidden What? Cupboard. <laughs> Which East Anglian warrior queen fought against the Romans? Joan of Arc. <laughs> Who was the leader of the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Rasputin. <laughs> 
in the films Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, which Boris played Frankenstein's monster. Boris Johnson. <laughs> 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 Which mountain range runs through Argentina? Oh, the Falklands. <laughs> Name any country with Spanish as its first language. Portugal. <laughs> right. Now, we're looking for a 19th century philosopher. First name's John Stuart. Surname beginning with M. Marx. <laughs> What symbol of German unification faces Parisa Platz in Berlin? The swastika. <laughs> the Gorbals is on the south bank of which river? The Rhine. <laughs> the Italian composer Puccini, born in 1858, had what first name? Vivaldi. <laughs> Which royal duke was governor of the Bahamas during the Second World War? The Duke of Wellington. <laughs> Featured on a Bank of England banknote, which economist wrote The Wealth of Nations? Milton Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> Give a slang word for your head. Nonce. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Marcus and Dumbritton. <laughs> it's all well sort of making light of what's happened in the year, but there have been major disasters and we have to cover them. Uh, the Titanic sank uh, rather tragically under its captain, Liz Truss. <laughs> and for the first time, she has broken her silence explaining why she sailed into an iceberg and sank the ship. Hi everyone, it's the Truster here! <laughs> so to be serious for a moment, 24 hours ago I was the proud captain of the Titanic, steaming across the ocean with a mandate to break international records for a transatlantic crossing. Hashtag life goals. <laughs> Who would have thought that just a day later I would be sitting here on the seabed after the worst disaster in maritime history? <laughs> After a period of reflection and soul searching, I have come to a number of conclusions. One, there was nothing wrong with the direction I was going, i.e. straight towards the iceberg. But I admit that I was going too fast, particularly at the moment of collision. But this was not my fault, since no one had told me that it would be dangerous to hit an iceberg in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Shrugging woman emoji. <laughs> I was trying to do something radical, and the only reason I failed was that the woke nautical establishment tried to prevent me. <laughs> as soon as I announced full steam ahead into the iceberg, the bureaucratic blob <laughs> swung into action, tote Snoresville. <laughs> the so called experts included the navigator the first officer, the chief engineer and the entire crew telling me to change course before you kill everyone. I still maintain that I was right and that I was also right to throw first mate Quateng overboard just before the ship sank. Even though he followed my instructions to the letter. So apart from the crash with the iceberg and 1,500 people perishing in a freezing sea, the whole voyage was a huge success. <laughs> Legendary I <cost>. know! <laughs> time, from some, time for some poetry from our uh, resident threnodist, E.J. Thribb, who celebrates the lives of those who've recently passed. We'll start in memoriam, Sir Bobby Charlton. So farewell then, Sir Bobby Charlton. Busby Babe, Red Devil, and hero of the 1966 England World Cup team. Now we mourn your passing, but not as much as your goal scoring, obviously. <laughs> Loyal, modest, and diligent, you were the very opposite of a modern footballer. <laughs> 
You didn't even have a hair transplant. <laughs> As Keith says in his moving tribute on Facebook, they think it's all comb over, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> And um, going from poetry to poetry in motion, you see the segue there. Mm. I'm on the one show later. <laughs> uh, we try and cover football and we try to cover the big documentaries. Uh, we watch them so you don't have to. Uh, this is the Netflix documentary about David Beckham, condensed for you. The following facts all come from this documentary. If all David Beckham's tattoos were put end to end, they would stretch for 87 miles. <laughs> Posh last smiled at 9.45 a.m. on the 4th of December 1996, <laughs> upon discovering that she'd won 25 quid on the premium bonds. There were originally eight Spice Girls, but manager Simon Fuller fired chili, cayenne and paprika <laughs> after deciding they were too hot for young pop fans. <laughs> David Beckham's hair is sponsored by over 700 multinational companies, including Christian Dior, Hyatt Regency Hotels, Accenture, and Marconi Weapons Systems. <laughs> At the height of his fame, David Beckham's right big toe was insured for $8 billion, slightly more than NASA's space shuttle. Alternative names considered by Posh and Bex for their first child, Brooklyn, included Bronx, Battery, Manhattan, Staten, I Staten Island, Greenwich Village and Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester United manager Alex Ferguson often stayed on after training to practice kicking football boots at players' faces. <laughs> Eventually, he could bend an Adidas size 9 around the locker from 25 yards. <laughs> David Beckham was cast in Guy Ritchie's film King Arthur, Legend of the Swerve as Sir Kick-A-Lot. He was on screen for over 30 seconds and issued the immortal line, On me head, son, to Queen Guinevere, played by Vanessa Redgrave. <laughs> the Beckham's personal assistant, Rebecca Lewis, with whom he was rumoured to have had an affair, now runs a successful online plumbing business in Marbella called Rebecca's Lose. <laughs> <laughs> Model and socialite David Beckham once played football professionally. <laughs> <laughs> and all of those facts come from the Netflix documentary Coin It Like Beckham. <laughs> so, from Liz Truss, one one nightmare that you thought you'd lost <laughs> to someone who I'm afraid we haven't lost yet. Uh, that's Donald Trump, um, who earlier this year in one of his court cases um, had a fight with a pair of scales um, and made a speech outside the courthouse. This is the original speech at the courthouse when he was arrested for paying hush money to a porn actress. <laughs> <laughs> Get him out of here. I swear <laughs> to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing like the truth. <laughs> this trial is a complete travesty. I was put on a pair of scales when I arrived, which claimed I weighed 240 pounds. Fake news. I demand a recount. The scales are rigged. All those extra pounds have been added by the Democrats. True. The correct figure is 215 pounds, which is $270, <laughs> which is exactly how much tax I paid in the last 10 years. Great job. True news, fact. And it doesn't stop there. The authorities claim I am six foot one. More fake news. As everybody knows, I am a seven foot two man with a full head of hair and a golf handicap of minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> you can't trust any of the figures given by this court. As president, I want another four years and the court says I deserve 20. <laughs> More fake news. They can't even get the music right. When I came into the court, they started singing jail to the chief. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
This whole business over the actress and the hush money and the so-called corrupt payment is nonsense. It's nothing. It's a stormy in a decap. <laughs> Lewis McLeod. <clears throat> uh, Private Eye runs a column called Notes and Queries, which is a, a column for linguistic questions that our readers may have, phrases or words that they don't recognise. Uh, we had a lot of requests after the COVID inquiry, largely from people who'd been watching the COVID inquiry with their grandchildren and had no idea what the word fuck pig <laughs> meant. This is to help them out. Fuck a pig is the original Norwegian version of the cartoon we know as Peppa Pig. <laughs> In the Scandinavian series, Fucker Pig, voiced by legendary Icelandic actress Björk Dottidottir Björk Björksen, <laughs> is a crime-solving detective pig who ends up in every episode being roasted slowly by crime gangs <laughs> in an oven out inside an ice hotel. Uh, Fuck pigs were German First World War flying bombs manufactured by musicians' company Piggen und Fucher. <laughs> These uh, bombs were renowned for the squealing sound that they made in the air, <laughs> which terrified the Tommies on the front line, who, of course, could not pronounce the Teutonic moniker and so dubbed them fuck pigs. <laughs> An unexploded fuck pig can be seen in the Imperial War Museum. <laughs> which until 2016 was called the Metric War Museum. <laughs> uh, neither of these explanations is in fact correct. Fuck Pig is a greetings card company operating on the internet, <laughs> sending obscene messages to your loved ones. <laughs> Fuckpig.com. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next queries. <laughs> uh, talking of older people who won't leave the world stage, we come to Rupert Murdoch. Uh, earlier this year, he made a resignation speech saying he was going to step down and Many of us felt we'd already seen it on other programmes. But no, <laughs> this was the real Rupert resigning. Struth, I've decided to step down and appoint my successor. I have to face facts, I'm not 91 anymore. <laughs> Even though I'm much younger and fitter than Joe Biden, there comes a time for any media mogul to choose who will succeed. Obviously, none of my children will really succeed because they're all useless drongos. <laughs> but uh, I know the world is wondering who'll get my job. And for those of you who think I'm so bloody doddery that I can't tell the difference between reality and television programs about succession, let me list my children. There's James, Kendall, Lachlan, Shiv and her awful <laughs> ex-husband, Matthew Freud. Les, Roman, and, and some other ones. So I leave my company, Waystar Royco, in a lot better shape than that fictional news corp off TV. And as a proud Scotsman, my legacy will be reassured. Unlike that ridiculous caricature Australian loudmouth on telly, that's the truth, or my name's not Logan Roy. <laughs> so listen up. I decided to hand over to a brilliant, powerful, astute and visionary leader. My successor will be Rupert <laughs> Murdoch, <laughs> Chairman Eternus of News Corps and Fakes News. Suck it up, losers. Ladies and gentlemen, Rupert Murdoch still with us. Quick break for a news report. You'll have noticed a lot of the stories over the last year have been about the police, and Private Eye has had a, had a few of them. This is, is, is quite the weirdest of them. We ran a headline that said, Police had weird initiation rituals, finds report. 
The damning Casey report into the Met Police has found that some young recruits were forced to take part in a bizarre initiation ceremony in which they were made to investigate a burglary. <laughs> One young recruit said this. Uh, we had to go to the house where a burglary took place, take a statement from the homeowner, investigate the crime and then arrest the criminals responsible. Said another. It was so humiliating. I was expecting to roll up my trouser leg and expose my nipple. <laughs> but instead I had to fill out an incident report. <laughs> no actual serving Met officer would do anything so demeaning as investigate a crime. I had to go on sick leave for months. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more news reports. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'd hate you to think it's too serious. We do cover the world of celebrities and the world of autobiographies. There have been a lot of celebrity autobiographies this year, most of them written by Joan Collins. <laughs> we were very lucky to get her to write a short diary for us. Well, this past week I've been much in demand, making a hectic dash around the TV studios to promote my eighth volume of autobiography, Ooh La La, Tales I Haven't Told, that often except on chat shows. <laughs> but all my brilliant TV interviewers wanted to know just one thing. The lovely Graham Norton longed to know how I managed to look so amazing and so did the divine Holly Willoughby. You look so amazing, Dame Joan, so what's the secret? asked the impish Piers Morgan. <laughs> Fresh air, I say. <laughs> My hair has always been this color and I've never had a facelift or Botox like those common little movie stars of today. The other thing all my lovely interviewers want to know is about my affair with General Custer. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was first attracted to his enormous Stetson. After a whirlwind romance, the General invited me to come to Little Bighorn. Well, which is it, General? I said, it can't be both. <laughs> The moment we arrived there, we were surrounded by bare-chested Red Indians on horseback. Had they never heard of a well-pressed suit and tie with highly polished shoes? No, they should take a leaf out of Percy's book. After a couple of strong martinis, I made my excuses and left. I never heard from General Custer again. I sometimes wonder what became of him. So six months later, I eloped with the man who was to become my second husband, Captain W.G. Grace, <laughs> who I was then obliged to leave for an ill-fated affair with his nautical rival, Captain Pugwash. <laughs> but that, as they say, is a whole other book. Ladies and gentlemen, Joan Collins. <clears throat> Time for more poetry, and this is um, an LRG for not a person, but for an object, which E.J. Thribb sometimes does. This is um, a tribute to the proceedings at COP28, or as Private Eye always calls it, COP OUT28. <laughs> this is In Memoriam, Single-Use Plastic Plates and Knives and Forks. So, farewell then, single-use plastic tableware. You've had your chips <laughs> and are officially washed up. I say farewell, but you take 200 years to decompose. So not quite farewell yet. Keith says it is a, a step forward for the planet, but essentially we are all still forked. <laughs> and if that's too gloomy, it's time for our seasonal Christmas advert. We try and do um, an advertisement every time. Uh, we're um, doing this theatrical production and for a worthwhile charity. So this year we have persuaded Penelope Wilton uh, to launch our charity advert. The Captain Tom Foundation is proud to announce a new fundraising initiative in which the late Captain Sir Tom will perform a sponsored spin in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> at the behaviour of his daughter, Hannah Gimme Moore. <laughs> the legendary fundraiser and national treasure will be revolving in his resting place over a hundred <laughs> times a minute, and the money he raises will be misappropriated to pay for his daughter's <laughs> defence fees, 
with any extra money going to pay for the appeal against the demolition order of the Sir Tom Hot Tub and Jacuzzi and Spa <laughs> Complex in Hannah Gimme Moore's garden. And if any of you have been moved by that appeal, <laughs> <coughs> could you please visit the Captain Tom Foundation just taking page? <laughs> so, charity. Um, we're hoping to, um, that we will raise um, some money from you for that, but we also have to take into account some other people who've had a bad year. One of them, I'm afraid, is Boris Johnson. Um, yes, I know, your hearts are breaking. <laughs> uh, we all enjoyed his performance in front of the Select Committee on Standards in Public Life, but few of you will have seen his performance on the Select Committee on Standards in Private Life which was convened after Carrie's mum caught him having a drink with the nanny. Uh, the <laughs> this committee has uh, convened and it was chaired by Mrs Carrie Johnson. I put it to you, Mr Johnson, that you lied to your wife and deliberately misled her as to the circumstances of your drink with the nanny, Miss Frutella Norland, when your wife was away. I did you what you want. <laughs> Yeah, 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 what? No, 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 I said, what? It, 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 yeah, it was a work event. I said, what? It is very important to, to keep up the morale of staff, and Miss Frutella and I kept our distance at all times. I, I, two metres, maybe one, uh, maybe less. Uh, hands, face, space. And, um,. Was alcohol consumed? No booze was consumed. What about that bottle of wine that my mum saw you guzzling? Ah, uh, uh, I, I was ambushed by the bottle. <laughs> and the corkscrew. <laughs> and the two glasses. Yeah. They all ganged up on me and forced me to raise a glass with Miss Frutella to salute your absence. <laughs> And did you notice anything about the appearance of Miss Frutella, which possibly contravened the very strict rules I laid out before leaving you for five minutes to go off and give birth? I, I, I can assure you that the guidelines were followed at all times. I said rules, Boris, not guidelines. Uh, Gigi, uh, my understanding is that the rules were followed, if not in detail, then in spirit. Uh, 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 and... My advisors all failed to tell me that Miss Frutella was both young and very attractive. Oh, so you admit she was very attractive? I, I, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> Fwah, I, I'm sorry if you think that's what I said, but nothing could be further from the truth. Piffle, lies, nonsense and border that. Mr Johnson, the committee has decided to ask you to swear that you are telling the truth, either on the Bible or on the lives of your children. I, 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 I think I'd better do it on the Bible or else we're going to be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> right, Miss Frutella is sacked as of now and you are in the doghouse. Any objections? Yes, from Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Select Committee. That obviously wasn't entirely true, um, but the other compilation of true quotes found from sporting events we call commentator balls, and it's compiled by Simon Edmonds. And again, these are all real things that sports commentators said to fill in the time. We start with football, my special subject. <laughs> <laughs> this is Micah Richards on BBC One. We've taken off our earphones to see the atmosphere. Presenter on BT Sport. He's been clocked as the fastest player ever in the Bundesliga in terms of speed. <laughs> Dion Dublin, Radio 5 Live. I'm looking at the, the Manchester United players. Uh, they've got their hands on their hips, scratching their heads. <laughs> Presenter, BT Sport. He hit it right down the throat of Ramsdale, who saved it with his feet. <laughs> Radio 5 Live presenter. He'll be immortal forever. <laughs> John Hughes, BBC Scotland. There are six trophies out there, and he's won five of them. You can't do better than that. 
<laughs> Seb Hutchinson on ITV. The USA didn't quite finish off Vietnam as many <laughs> thought they should. <laughs> Julie Ferrington on Radio 5 Live. Well, uh, just hoping now, the Leeds fans, for Simon Hooper to blow the referee. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, commentator balls. <laughs> The trouble, of course, with any sporting event now is that it may be disrupted by protest. And many of you will have seen the Epsom Derby this year. But what you will have missed is the full commentary. As they go past the post with just one furlong to go, it's Protest Boy making a leg dash, but PC Plod is coming in from the rails with minimum wage steward on the outside in his distinctive day glow <laughs> colours. This is anybody's race, and as they approach the finish, the runners are all closing in. This is what the derby's all about. Thoroughbred demonstrators showing their form after months of training. Oh, oh, and Protest Boy has been caught with just yards to go. He's a faller. Oh no, oh no, terrible scenes here at Epsom. It looks like he's being put down by the crowd who are all booing him, so now we await the steward's inquiry into how the hell he got onto the course and why PC Plot showed insufficient <laughs> use of the whip. Then <laughs> Jeffrey Lewis. There were a lot of Just Stop Oil protests. We had a cartoon in this week's issue of a turkey with a banner saying, Just Stop Foil. <laughs> uh, there, there was a, an earlier Just Stop Anointing Oil um, during the coronation, which <laughs> brings us on to um, the royal family, who, who obviously have uh, created a lot of news this year. Uh, we have a, a, a royal correspondent, uh, a romantic novelist called Sylvie Crin, <laughs> who we use to cover these big events. And this is um, her short story, King of Troubles, Dame Sylvie Crin writing for Private Eye. King Charles has celebrated his 75th birthday with a glittering party at Claret House, accompanied by a 75-gun salute by the Grenadine Guards. Oh, my God! exclaimed a bleary-eyed Queen Camilla, nursing a restorative egg nog in the nog. <laughs> Are they still firing those bloody guns, or is it just inside my head? Charles smiled indulgently at the delicate post-party state of his fragile soulmate. Didn't the party go well? <laughs> Enthused King Charles. And everyone who was anyone was there. Camilla groaned and reached for a not-my-king-size Rothman's full-strength gasper. The best thing about the party was who didn't come, rasped Camilla. Owing to their not being invited, i.e. the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Hang on, old thing. It's a bit unfair to poor Harry and she who must name must not be mentioned. <laughs> it would have been very nice if they had been there. But even bloody nicer that they weren't. Well, I'm off to see the matinee of Backstairs Billy at the Duchess of York's Theatre, <laughs> all right? Apparently it uh, features your old nan and is meant to be bloody funny. She explained her absence, and with that, Charles was left alone with his thoughts. Yeah. Why do people want to see such inaccurate portrayals of the life of my family on stage and screen? Just like that programme, The Crown. I mean, nobody in their right mind would watch that rubbish. What time's it on? <laughs> Charles <coughs> idly flicked the buttons on the Poshiba TV remote until the Netflix logo appeared on the screen. And suddenly there he was, <coughs> looking young and chiselled, sitting in an aeroplane. And there in the seat in front of him on the British Airways flight from Barry's was the ghost of Diana herself. You're Charles. She was saying in an ethereal yet slowly voice. This is what you wanted all along. You and the Duke of Edinburgh and MI6 and Mossad and Mohammed Al-Fayed. <laughs> no, no, no. Charles's dapper doppelganger was protesting tearfully on the television. I regret everything. Please forgive me. You are the best and most revolutionary modernising force in the hidebound and antiquated royal institution. The real Charles was shocked. 
This dialogue is ludicrous. <laughs> In the whole situation, it's absolutely unbelievable. He switched off the TV irritably and threw the remote control at a painting of Venice by Juan Cornetto. <laughs> I mean, it really is quite a... Appalling. Came a ghostly voice. Charles almost jumped out of his royal skin. It was Diana, sitting beside him on the Louis Theroux chaise lounge, <laughs> looking doe-eyed and eternally youthful. Diana, you look just the same, said Charles. Not like me. Yeah. The ghost agreed. Well, you're no Dominic West, that's for sure. And Elizabeth Debicki doesn't really do me justice. But I'm here as a messenger to tell you to put things right between you and Harry. Sort it out. Man up. Be the father he needs you to be. Don't repeat the fateful patterns of the past. This dialogue is even worse than the tale. <laughs> 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 remonstrated the real king but it was too late the apparition had delivered its otherworldly message and was preparing to leave remember Charles there are three of us in this marriage now you Camilla and me <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the cast <laughs> <laughs> Uh, time for another poem to show our genuine upmarket interest in the arts, cinema, foreign languages. Uh, this is Poetry Corner in memor memoriam Jean-Luc Godard. So, farewell then, Jean-Luc Godard. You were the captain of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, hang on. <laughs> Wikipedia says you were actually a legendary film director of the French Nouvelle Vague. So, adieu then, Jean-Luc Godard. Your most famous film was Breathless. And now, sadly, <laughs> <laughs> so are you. Fan. <coughs> <coughs> We do occasionally have a, an attempt to cover how grim uh, the news in the world is, but not too often and not much tonight. Um, uh, but Private Eye um, employed a particular fine historian um, to cover this. It was um, Paul Gambaccini, uh, the pop historian, who announced that there was a new single out from the Fab Four. Yes, the perennial popular quartet from yesteryear is back with an amazing new hit. Thanks to new technology, the Fab Four, War, Famine, Death, and Ringo, <laughs> look can sound as fresh and lively as ever. The Fab Four horsemen of the apocalypse are making an unwelcome return and have released a never-before-heard classic, All You Need Is Hate. One critic hailed it as one of their greatest hits, right up there with Give War a Chance. <laughs> We are all living in a nuclear submarine. <laughs> and of course, the timeless help. <laughs> Paul Gambaccini, we expresses all of our views. Um, the other person who I'm very keen on um, is Nikki Haslam, um, who every year produces a list of what's common and what isn't for uh, those who need to know about social etiquette. Private Eye. We had the scoop this year, a full list of what is common. Colds, common. Wimbledon, common. <laughs> Alternatives to garden, common. Market, common. Mac, common. Book of prayer, common. <laughs> Man who for whom fanfare written by Aaron Copeland. Oh, come on, think about it. <laughs> common. Sense. Common. And certainly none of that from Nicky. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr Haslam. <laughs> Proper politics we have to cover, um, particularly Scottish politics. And Private Eye, again, we use as our correspondent for the major Scottish um, affairs, we use a poet, the world's worst poet, William McGonagall. Um, amazing events this year and 
This is the poem we ran. It was called Lines on the Historic Police Action Against the Former SNP Leadership. <laughs> Twas in the year 2023 that a police drama hit Scotland better than anything on TV. Inspector McNacker arrested Nicola Sturgeon's spouse and sent a fleet of officers to call her Peter Murrell at their house. They set up a tent in the garden of the famous Twosome, as if they'd committed a murder or something equally gruesome. What were the police looking for? It was like line of duty. Was it cash or gold or some other undeclared booty? Next, they went to Murrell's mother's home, 92 and still alive, and seized a brand new camper van that was sitting in her drive. <laughs> there it was, 110,000 pounds of a luxurious motor home that allows the owner over the glens and highlands to roam. <laughs> Without, of course, having to pay for a hotel or a B&B, thus saving money for canny tourists who like a holiday for free. <laughs> But no one can explain why such a vehicle should be bought by the SNP, and answers to these questions are urgently sought. Is this why Sturgeon really decided to retire before the party got stuck in the metaphorical mire? I should say that Mr. Murrell was released without charge. I have no desire to risk a fine for contempt of court, possibly large. <laughs> but in yeah. the chaos, it is interesting who is laughing the most in the hope that their enemies are now going to be toast. Is it Scottish Labour or the Caledonian Tories? No, the familiar kilted figure coming once again to the fore is Alex Salmond of Alba, <laughs> the former leader of the SNP, who, truth to tell, can barely contain his glee. Ah, alas, he says, this is a tragedy. <laughs> As he takes out his hanky, crying tears of joy, at the downfall of the wee former First Minister and look-alike cranky. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis MacLeod. Uh, a quick look at the environment. Uh, the Environment Secretary, uh, Therese Coffey, has in fact resigned, but the legacy is meant to be that the new regulatory bodies that um, uh, sort out the environment will work. So here's a quick list of the new regulatory bodies in full. Off what? Regulator in charge of failing to regulate water companies. <laughs> Off skim. Regulator in charge of failing to stop profiteering by water companies. Off trot. Regulator in charge of failing to stop off what regulators from trotting off to lucrative jobs in the water companies. <laughs> Off turn. Regulator in charge of failing to stop water companies from turning off the taps when the reservoirs of cash run dry. Off turd. Regulator in charge of <laughs> failing to stop water companies from filling rivers in the sea with excrement. Off what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> regulator in charge of failing to stop water regulators doing anything at any point. point. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, off what? <laughs> Uh, time for another thrib. So if we could have uh, another poetry corner. This, uh, we try and celebrate the lives of um, the obscure as well as the famous. And this is Lines on the Death of Ralph Whistler, the celebrated dodoologist. So, farewell then, Ralph Whistler. You were a dodo expert with an extensive collection of dodo droppings, dodo bones, and other dodo-related paraphernalia. <laughs> but now, alas, you are as dead as a... <laughs> What's the phrase? Uh, oh yes, that's it. Doornail. <laughs> <laughs> In memory of Ralph <coughs> Whistler. <laughs> uh, we can't avoid this any longer. The main political events of the year. Now, Private Eye started running a Prime Minister's WhatsApp group uh, <laughs> about a year ago, but this was before um, uh, uh, Hancock handed it all over uh, to the committee, so it became more of a documentary. Um, and then the, the COVID committee got hold of everybody's WhatsApp group, and we realised we were more or less just writing it down. Uh, but we've kept up with it 
and we still do have a slight scoop um, on the rest of the papers. This is the very latest Prime Minister's WhatsApp group. Now, because it's a WhatsApp group, it, it's you know, largely on your phone, so I'll have to help a bit by giving some of the names, just in case you're not sure who they are. <coughs> so, this week's WhatsApp group. First up, David Cameron. Hi, guys. Let's get down to business. And um, by the way, please call me Lord Dave. <coughs> Rishi Sunak. Hang on, Lord Dave. I'm still Prime Minister. Oh, was that the deal? Yes, of course. My bad. Guilty face emoji. <laughs> Carry on, Sunak. Thanks, Lord Dave. This is the big reset before the election where we turn the corner. Lee Anderson. You mean where you turn the fucking corner? <laughs> No, Lee, we put the past behind us. And then fucking rehire him as foreign secretary. Talk about eating mess. <laughs> Shit <Dave> joke emoji. <laughs> David Cameron. I can see we're going to get on, Lee. Or can I call you Oiki? <laughs> <laughs> and talking of friends, can I introduce you to a good friend of mine, Lex Greensill? Good night, Poms. Dave's got a bonza deal for you and your economy. <laughs> Reverse wombat finance. Mate rates, bunga city. What can go wrong? The administrators have removed Mr. Greensill <laughs> on the grounds that he's overdue an appointment at His Majesty's pleasure. <laughs> David Cameron. Incidentally, if anyone needs some good Chinese business contacts, I can put you in touch with some friends of mine. Mr. Chi Po from the Chinese Security Services. It is all right, uh, Lord Dave. We are already here, <laughs> monitoring all your messages. <laughs> the administrator has tried to remove the Chinese security from the group, but is having technical difficulties. <laughs> Rishi Sunak. Thanks, Lord Dave. And look, unlike you, we're doing tax cuts. We're back to being proper Tories. Taking 2p off national insurance is a crowd-pleasing, barnstorming vote winner. For the fucking Labour Party, <laughs> baby. Jeremy Hunt. Hang on. I'm still Chancellor. <laughs> I'm meant to announce tax cuts, even though I'm against them. And Rishi has announced them anyway. But I did freeze alcohol duty. That was clever. <laughs> Aye, if people are going to vote for us, we need every everyone to be pissed as fucking possible <laughs> on election day. <laughs> It isn't just the booze that's going to win us the election. I kept the triple lock for pensioners because they're the ones who are going to vote for us. Isn't that right, Esther, my new Minister for Common Sense? Esther McVeigh. Absolutely. And a good job he didn't kill all the old people during the pandemic. <laughs> Honestly, Bishy, with your three-word catchphrase, let people die. <laughs> that wasn't my catchphrase. Oh, tetchy. I am not tetchy. Oh, touchy. I am not touchy, out of touchy, tetchy or titchy. Now that's your fucking catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the WhatsApp group. <clears throat> uh, there, were, there were bigger news stories um, in the year, particularly um, the story about uh, morning television. Uh, the story of uh, Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby, uh, which uh, the BBC had to in interrupt its coverage of Gaza, to <laughs> they actually did, to announce that Holly Willoughby had decided to step down. Private Eye ran a cover saying that F Philip Schofield had done a runner, which... Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Some of our readers found funnier than others. Um, <laughs> but breakfast television was the big saga, and uh, the two presenters on it, who the eye referred to as Phil Airtime and Holly Forgettable. <laughs> uh, anyway, what actually happened was that a very serious um, media commentator joined the fray. This was Eamon Holmes, who immediately gave us the real story about what had been happening. Hi, it's a cover-up, a total <laughs> cover-up. And I'm not prepared to take it anymore. I'm here to speak for the people who haven't got a voice, the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Let's face facts, shall we? Philip Schofield created an atmosphere that was toxic. 
Mr. Goody Two Shoes was totally different off camera. When, when he thought no one was looking, I'd see him setting fire to other people's lockers. <laughs> <laughs> Making, making Nazi salutes and pulling the wings off birds. <laughs> Sad to say, I once came across him in a corridor plotting an armed bank raid with two accomplices in Balaclavas. <laughs> I, I would now, now appeal to anyone who has ever been held at gunpoint by Schofield or thinks they might have been in another life <laughs> to get in touch and stop others suffering a similar fate. <laughs> with no time to lose, my friend, really. And, and to anyone who asks why this brilliant broadcaster and titan of morning television has been so badly treated by ITV, I say this, you're right, you're right. I should never have been sacked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disgrace. And when I see you down the job center, Schofield, remember this, there's a queue. <laughs> Evan Holmes. Uh, back to Royal News. We try and keep you um, totally up to date on this, and we run a, a feature called Court Circular. This is Court Circular, Kensington Palace, Tuesday. Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales will look lovely today. <laughs> she will begin by looking lovely playing tennis or lacrosse or ping pong, and later she will look lovely at the official opening of something or other, and even more lovely when she visits a school or possibly a community centre. But not quite as lovely as she will look in the evening when she'll attend a gala. Her Royal Highness will then also be looking lovely wearing spots or stripes or anything really, topped with a hat or a fascinator or a tiara, or just her own lovely hair. But rest assured, she will be looking lovely and cool and elegant and fragrant and, well, lovely, really. And if we're really lucky, she'll get out of a car and show us her legs. And then we can run a series of headlines, including... Her Royal Finest. The Princess of Wales. Knees up Mother Kate. Kate's Royal Legacy. That's what we call a stocking filler. For knees a jolly good royal. Aunt Megan's legs horrible. <laughs> Court circular. <laughs> uh, it's not just trivia and the royal family. Private Eye does try and cover the major stories in the world, particularly the major financial stories. Um, and this story we ran in the middle um, of last year, and I think we were fairly fairly much ahead of everyone else. Uh, it was a new bank failure that threatens the global financial system. The world economy was teetering on the brink of disaster at the news that the bank of mum and dad was about to collapse. <laughs> this respected and previously stable financial institution now appears to be riddled with bad debt and toxic investments. Said a representative of the bank of mum and dad, mum, well, to be honest, we've just thrown good money after bad. We invested in our son, Simon, and hoped to see some sort of return on the second-hand car he was talking about. Another bank insider, Dad, said, If we'd exercised due diligence and checked out the state of his room, we might have given Simon a lower credit rating. <laughs> to be honest, we didn't stress test the studio flat with his mate's investment proposal. <laughs> It turned out that the entirety of the property funds were invested instead in the alcohol sector, <laughs> mainly vodka. The bank of mum and dad denied that they'd been irresponsible lenders and in a statement delivered from head office, the living room, Mum said, Well, that's unfair. We, we checked all his paperwork, uh, birth certificate, etc. And he's definitely our boy. <laughs> well, we'd do anything for him apart from lend him any more money. The knock-on effect of this withdrawal of credit has led to a run on the banks of mum and dad, with billions being refused to <laughs> offspring all over the globe. Experts believe that if banks of mum and dad continue to fail, international capitalism will go into meltdown. The housing market will collapse and all children will live with their parents forever. <laughs> Said the chairman of the bank of mum and dad. OK, we give in. Here's a couple of grand to tide you over, but this is the last time, <laughs> definitely. The Bank of Mum and Dad. <laughs> um, 
The other thing we try and cover is uh, medical advances, which have changed people's lives. Um, and again, we tend to do this in poetry. This is a poem, it's lines on the 25th anniversary of Viagra. So, let's have a standing ovation. <laughs> All rise for the little blue wonder pill. You were discovered by accident during trials for a heart drug. So, in a sense, you were a cock up. <laughs> Still, many thought you would be a flop. But you have gone on and on and on and on and on. How do you keep it up? Viagra, a miracle uh, that's changed Rupert Murdoch's life <laughs> in particular. So, um, back to uh, morning television. Uh, we, we can't resist the big stories. Uh, this is, uh, again, it's a royal story and a television story. Another of our favourite royals recently presented television, uh, an episode of This Morning. It is Sarah Ferguson. Hello, hello, hello. And a very big, super big, biggie, biggie, big, big <laughs> welcome to a truly, specially special episode of This Morning. I'm Sarah, Duchess of York, <laughs> and uh, I'm a super ginormous fan of the show, and today I'm talking to Top Chef Marcus Mean. Oh, sorry, uh, whoopsie. Marcus Bean, memo to self, bring the specs. <laughs> Typical Fergs. <laughs> uh, Marcus is going to show us how to make the perfect piece of toast. Super to see you, Marcus. Now, toast is, my, uh, is one of my absolute faves, and I've often wondered how to make it because you never see it in shops. And um, <laughs> so now uh, you're going to actually show us, aren't you? I can't wait. Well, uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, well, first, you get a slice of bread. Bread? Whoa, amazing. <laughs> Who'd have thought it all starts with a slice of bread? You know, I've often wondered. And you put your bread in a toaster. But hang on. Isn't it much too broad to fit in that little slot? You, ah, you turn it so it's vertical. Lummy! <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, give it a couple of minutes and out it pops as toast. Oh, believe it, Paul. Oh, mm. oh, and it tastes so, well, toasty. God, you're doing my head in here. Join us later. We'll be back after the break. <laughs> the Duchess. <coughs> <coughs> I realise we've got to this stage, we're fairly near the end of the show, and I've failed to give you a message of hope. And it is Christmas. So I think now it is imperative that we give you Keir Starmer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is his Christmas message to cheer you all up. Hello. Can I take this opportunity to wish everyone a very sensible Christmas. <laughs> and by everyone, I mean those people who are prepared to be realistic in their expectations and demands. Because Britain does not have unlimited resources, whatever white-haired old men with beards may have told you in the past. What's important to remember at this time of year is that we all have a lower expectation about what will be in our stocking this year and in years to come. Even a satsuma may be a tall order, thanks to 13 years of Tory small orange austerity. <laughs> when a Labour government wins back power next Christmas, it will all be very different. And I promise that there will be somewhere between three and three and a half percent more satsumas in your stockings, and that we will all be at least one and a half percent merrier. <laughs> I'm sorry that I had to deselect Santa and remove him from the Labour Party. But <laughs> I'm sorry he was a loose cannon with an unauthorised policy of giving away far too much on an uncosted basis. <laughs> Naturally, Mr Claus has the right to stand as an independent, and I appreciate he does have a following among the young and naive Clausenistas. <laughs> but we in the grown-up world of responsible politics know that there is no bottomless sack of presents and certainly no magic chocolate money Christmas tree. <laughs> so, on that note, I hope that all your Christmas wishes come true, so long as they're fiscally responsible. <laughs> and a happy new care to you all. <laughs> Cheers, Dama. Mm. 
We try and cover current affairs, we try and cover, cover breaking news. And if you remember earlier this year, one of the big stories was the theft of some priceless artefacts from the British Museum. They'd just gone. Um, and Private Eye ran this story, fairly large, saying theft of artefacts from British Museum. The man at the centre of a huge theft of ancient treasures from the British Museum has refused to give them back. He told police... Yeah, I nicked them, but they're mine now. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, the objects were obtained illegally, but that's history for you. <laughs> and there's nothing the previous owners can do about it. And he continued... I'll be displaying the antiquities in my front room and, to be honest, I will take better care of them than at the British Museum. <laughs> I mean, someone could just walk in there and steal them. My home will be open to visitors from all over the world, free of charge, except for the occasional special exhibition in the kitchen, which will cost hundreds of pounds and be very difficult to get tickets for. When quizzed further, the thief said... I have proposed an arrangement to British Museum Chairman George Osborne where I loan the artefacts back to the museum for a limited period, but on the understanding that they give them back to me because they're mine now. <laughs> Finders, keepers, museums, weepers. And the BBC has just learned that the Metropolitan Police finally have identified the man at the centre of the British Museum theft. Inspector Knacker says... We have arrested a 257-year-old man known only as Lord Eldon. <laughs> he denied theft and claims the marbles fell off the back of a necropolis. <laughs> when we apprehended him, we shouted, Freeze! <laughs> 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 My favourite joke of the evening. <laughs> uh, yes, so we do. We, we cover um, the cultural sector and we try not to uh, neglect the educational sector, particularly the 7% of it that constitute the public schools. Uh, Private Eye is very keen on following uh, the progress of a, a particular uh, public school called St Cakes. And uh, this is the news earlier this year from St Cakes. The famous independent Midlands boarding school, St Cakes, has today announced that it will no longer be asking its pupils to sit the GCSE examinations. Said the headmaster, Mr RGJ Kipling, <laughs> these examinations no longer reflect the educational values of a school like St Cakes. They're too narrow in scope, too restricted in aspiration and too difficult to pass. <laughs> he added, last year, Cakeians managed a disappointing 0% pass rate, which suggests that there is something very wrong with the examination system. He continued, despite replacing several teachers, well, all of them, and appointing Mr. GBT chatbot to the staff room, as head of classics, maths, geography, history, art, science, philosophy, our results did not improve. He then explained, Cakeians benefit from an all-round education that's not obsessed with academic success, instead learning a wide range of skills which are more useful in the modern world, such as gaming, vaping, and shoplifting. <laughs> He concluded, the most important thing about the school is that we turn out pupils who pay up in full and on time, <laughs> irrespective of their abilities. Said Mr Kipling, as the school motto goes, quis paget entrat. Who pays, gets in. <laughs> he concluded, we make exceedingly good cakeians. <laughs> and even if they don't get any GCSEs, Many of them go on to run the country. <laughs> <laughs> it is nearly time for us to go, uh, but as <coughs> a, a final item, uh, I couldn't resist reinstating the letter from Sir Herbert Gusset to the Daily Telegraph. Harry Enfield has agreed to take on the baton um, from uh, the late, great uh, John Sessions, and this is a letter we wrote earlier this year that was written pretty much uh, 
to the Daily Telegraph <coughs> to complain about something else. May I add my voice <coughs> to those of your many readers who have been asking why on earth we're allowing these revolting, depraved drag shows <laughs> to be offered to our children. In the old days, youngsters were taken to the pantomime where they were treated to wholesome, traditional entertainment where men dressed up as women, <laughs> women dressed up as men, nobody mentioned it. I fondly remember seeing Widow Twanker, played by a middle-aged man, and Dick Whittington, played by a rather delightfully legged girl, <laughs> exchange innocent quips such as midnight and still no dick, <laughs> <coughs> to the delight of the toddlers in the crowd. <laughs> I shall also never forget the rather lovely Christopher Biggins playing Aladdin's <laughs> mother and saying, give it a rub, son, and see what, <laughs> what happens. <laughs> the laughter echoed round the walls of the Worthing Hippodrome. This was, and should remain, the classic way British children <laughs> learn about life. <laughs> Not some tacky so-called drag show <laughs> where transvestites <laughs> make a mockery of all we hold dear. <laughs> this Christmas, I shall be taking my grandchildren out of school <laughs> and off to the Western Supermare Palladium to see Mother Goose played by Brian Cox, <laughs> saying, come and goose me, ducky, <laughs> to the delightful young man, Buttons, Bonnie Langford. <laughs> Surely this is the way forward for Britain in the 21st century. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, oh no, no, it, it isn't. Is <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gusset. Um, thank you, Harry, and thank you all very much uh, for coming to our slightly longer and even more self-indulgent <laughs> uh, show um, here at the Criterion. I'm very grateful to you all. We will be signing books um, uh, in the um, bar later, and there'll be full, as full instructions from the voice of God, um, <laughs> I gather, which is coming in later. But in the meantime, it remains for me to thank hugely my utterly brilliant cast, Harry Enfield, Jan Ravens and Lewis MacLeod. Oh,